All right. Um, welcome. We're coming to an end. Uh, next week, as God allows, we'll give you the last of the uh, lessons on true, from the book True Spirituality. That'll make 30 lessons. So we've been at it for a while, <clears throat> but it um, uh, takes that while to get away. The, the problem that we face is that um, sin and, I don't know, just getting tired of true spirituality. We just drift into ritualism. We drift into uh, <clears throat> not thinking about praying. And so it just turns into a ritual. Um, I, I've noticed that several of the people that I'm around have been taught to begin their prayer, Lord, we love you so much. And I, it, it strikes me because that's an unusual opening to me. I was always our Father which art in heaven or something like that. And um, so I can say that without much thinking as I'm getting prepared to actually pray. But when they say, oh, Lord, we love you so much, it just... Sound like a ritual thing that that's, that's not something I want to be saying as a ritual, not thinking about it. You, you, you want to really be meaning that. So a constant challenge for us to keep on praying, but always make it fresh, always make it a true conversation with God. Uh, not just talking to ourselves, encouraging ourselves or others. And... Uh, we need to get back to true spirituality, true understanding of, uh, of Christianity truly in the spirit, not just religiously thinking. People say, I do it religiously. It means I don't have to think about it anymore. I just do it and keep doing it, you know. And uh, we want to avoid that. True spirituality, here's what we've looked at so far, man's separation from himself and man's separation from his fellow man. Substantial healing in personal relationships, and we've gone through all of this, and this day, we want to look at declaring God to the world, declaring God to the world. This is uh, not just about us learning and growing. Uh, the, the focus of the church is that, because that's our stated goal, the edifying or the perfecting or the maturing of the saints. So, um, uh, but the uh, Great Commission given before the church had started, before the church had begun, I should say, sounds like they just started late, but uh, this was before the church began, uh, Christ gave the Great Commission to a group of believers. And uh, so the Great Commission is actually not an organizational uh, mandate, a church mandate, as much as it is your mandate, your, your, your mandate as a believer. Uh, you are to be bringing people to Christ and then uh, introducing them to the church for baptism and for uh, spiritual growth. Declaring God to the world. So last time we were talking about Uzzah, who uh, David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. This is the, uh, the most holy uh, instrument of the of the tabernacle and, the, and then the temple. It actually represented the presence of God, and so it was to be completely covered, away from praying eyes, and carried by staves, uh, run through the rings on the side, and carried on the shoulders of the priests, and a very solemn thing. Uh, here it was sitting out on a cart oxen pulling it, uh, a method invented by the pagan uh, Philistines who were sending it back because it was causing supernatural trouble where they were. And the uh, oxen stumbled, the, oc the cart shook, and so Uzzah, for this emergency, put his hand out to steady the ark and God struck him dead. And um, we uh, talk about this that Sometimes we say, well, I know it's not what God would really want, but we have to do it now because it's an emergency. So instead of taking matters into our hands and deciding to handle the church in a worldly way because of a perceived emergency, we should always look to him. 
there is no emergency that he did not foresee. None of this is a surprise to him. In fact, you read, go back to the, the progress of sin, the progress of degradation, and you see all of, all of this that we're facing here was already predicted. You and I ought not to be surprised that this is happening to our America. Um, this is the path without Christ. So we should always look to him. We will strictly follow his revealed way and pray for his providential leading. Pro by providential, I mean uh, how he provides and uh, what, what he gives to us along the way. So recognize in, in what situation we live. This is a present troublemaking world age. And I get that from Galatians 1.4, who gave himself for our sins, Christ gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us. Now, his focus here is not just deliver us from hell. That's all, almost always our focus. We get saved, we're delivered from hell. Okay, we're done. He says, no, I want to deliver you from this present evil world. The word present means that which is at hand. And then evil is the word that... Uh, it, the root of it is based in trouble, and the idea of this evil is that it causes you trouble. There is God's ideal way of life. This is the high road, the, um, the, uh, the way following his law, following his will. You have the best possible life. And what causes the trouble? What's the troublemaker in that? Sin. Because you're doing things that he said, don't do that, it'll be bad for you. And so we do it, and we say, oh, God's punishing me. Well, he, t he warned you about it. He said, don't do it because it's bad for you. Now it's bad for you, and you're saying, you're, I'm going to blame God. Well, blame yourself because you chose to do it. Because sin brings its own consequences. We know this about alcoholism, about uh, heavy smoking, all these things. Uh, they, they just takes, uh, ruins your health. Uh, many of the sins that man indulges in, overeating and uh, sexual misconduct and all these things. They have a natural consequence, and it just brings it with us. So this isn't God being mean. He, he warned us not to do it. And so evil is the troublemaker. It, it brings trouble into God's ideal way of life, and uh, then we say, why, why am I going through these thorns and snares, you know? because that's the path you chose. And uh, so according to the will of God our Father, that would be the best way, but deliver us, deliver us from this. This is to deliver is to carry us away, bear us away. That's uh, the word that's used in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil, <clears throat> same word, evil. Now, our human-based choices no matter how well intentioned, will not handle things very well. Uh, well, uh, you know, Uzzah said, well, I'm not going to let it fall. This is the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to steady it. And God struck him dead for his uh, lack of piety, his lack of understanding what God wanted. So we can be well-intentioned. Um, you can... In the dark of night, go get an aspirin, find out you've taken some wrong medicine, and suffer for it, you see. So, well intentions don't handle it. We do not have the advantage of omniscience or perfect holiness. These belong to God alone. Now, the church, like Israel before, must communicate God, see, not our religious views. We, we need to communicate God and his way to the world around us. Look at Deuteronomy 4, 6 to 8. Keep therefore and do them, the God's laws, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. <clears throat> he says this is how the nations will see you as wise and understanding because your laws work so well. Because I gave them to you, see. Which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. 
For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them? In other words, they were illustrating what happens if you pay attention to God, you see. And uh, they're communicating God. As the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for, for what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? He says, you will have a, such a better life if you're following these rules. And people are going to say, wow, how did you come up with that? One man was telling me, he says, well, I think they just paid attention and if it didn't work, they tried something else. And then I said, you mean these people who were, grew up as slaves in Egypt and had no education, and rushed out into the, into the uh, wilderness and walked around 40, these people were that smart? He goes, okay, if you say God told them. I said, yes, that's what I say. <laughs> Testifying of the Father was also the work of Jesus. Communicating God was one of Christ's great purposes. Uh, several passages here, uh, John 1, 18. No man hath seen God at any time. Why is that so? Because God does not have a body like man. He's a spirit being. He's invisible. So we, we can't see him. He's not subject to uh, reflecting light rays and all that stuff. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared him. So we see, we perceive the invisible God by looking at Christ. Notice then he emphasizes it in John 8, 28, 29. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, talking about being crucified, then shall ye know that I am, I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, you know, self-concept here, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I, al I do always those things that please him. I am here representing him. John 12, 49, 50, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. I had to ponder that for a while because say and speak pretty much the same thing. But he seems to be emphasizing the distinction there. And yet in the, in the words themselves, you don't find much of a distinction, just two words for speaking. But the way they're used, the first word is sometimes translated commandment, and to command. So uh, this seems to be what I, uh, what I should say officially, what I say as God's commands, and what I should speak, which is his everyday speech, not particularly talking about what, what you should do. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Uh, this produces life. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. You see, a direct communication. And then, uh, talking to Doubting Thomas, uh, John 14, 9a and c, Jesus saith, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And of course, the, we could, humans could see him literally with the eyes, but they could see in the sense of perceiving the invisible father uh, when they understood him. You, you gain all that there is to know of God the Father uh, by understanding that Christ is representing him. So if the church lives by faith, it will declare God to the world. This is kind of automatic. Uh, the world is not living by faith. The world is not having a good time. The world is suffering because of sin, their sin and other sin, the effects of sin, and we're suffering. The world expects religious people to be wallowing in little faith. Just We just do what we're told. We don't know why, you know. I was thinking of the Roman Catholics who were told that when they eat that 
little wafer thing, that it actually is turning into the flesh of Jesus Christ. And when they drink their wine, they use alcoholic wine usually, that it actually turns into the blood of Jesus. Now, these are people who normally could drink wine and know what that tastes like. They could eat meat and know what that tastes like. Perhaps even had tasted blood and knew what that tasted like. And they're saying, you know, nothing about this seems real. But that's what they tell us. So we, we believe it, and it's a, a, a religious thing, I guess. And they were taught to believe that it's not real uh, by their practice every time they met. Great faith practices Christ's leadership rather than acting as though he was far off. My wife, a great example to me in so many ways, we were talking about that sonic boom, evidently, that we heard. She heard. I was down in the basement listening to a magician's lecture, so I didn't hear that. But uh, she heard the boom, and uh, my, my son last night was saying that uh, they, uh, he didn't hear it, <clears throat> but uh, it was reported that somebody, and somebody from, he and I are basically in the same neighborhood. We're just around a bit. And uh, so somebody reported it must have been an explosion in our neighborhood. He says, neither of us were home. We were wondering if it was, a, did our house explode? Uh, but uh, anyway, my wife hears the boom, and it sounded ominous. And so she immediately prayed, Lord, do I need to be worried about this? Is this something I should be going into the basement about? Um, practice Christ's leadership. Do not get excited about building the church in our own wisdom and power. Now, here's an idea. We could do this. This will bring them in. We deal with matters well beyond building a great enterprise on earth. What we're dealing with is not just getting a bunch of people here. So many churches do that, and then they don't know what to, what to do with this, you know, mangy crowd. That they don't know anything about the Word of God. They don't know how to obey God. Uh, but they're here to be entertained. And um, yeah, the point of bringing people to maturity it didn't occur to them. So you can't do that with a mass. So we are dealing with something far more important than just trying to do it on our own. So point G, fighting the supernatural battle. We are in a supernatural battle that extends into the heavens. The angels, the fallen angels, are involved in all of this. The battle is not merely battling other religions or other organizations or other men. The real battle of the church is the total war that includes the unseen war in the unseen portion of reality. You're saying you're talking about the unseen? Well, of course. Do you think your eyes see everything? That's why they have x-rays, infrared, all this stuff. Uh, you, we, we, there's a whole band of color we can't see on either end beyond ultraviolet and beyond infrared. Uh, there's a whole area of hearing. You know, the, the dogs are perking up when they have that in, uh, unhearable whistle. And, uh, uh, and my unhearable is quite a bit larger than most, but uh, uh, things can be too low for us to hear, too high for us to hear. There are pressures that are so slight that we can't feel them. And... Uh, and, or so universal, like the atmospheric pressure on us, about 16 pounds per inch on us. You say, that would be heavy. Well, you're feeling it right now, but it's, it's just all over you, so you don't feel it at all. You, you don't recognize it. Um, if you were to put a suction on your skin, uh, what you're doing is removing the air pressure from that section, and that's how your body reacts if you remove that pressure. I'm really getting off track, aren't I? But anyway, there's a lot of stuff that's unseen, unperceived all around us. And we, we shouldn't be surprised if there are um, beings living in that unseen area. And we know from the scripture that there are. This is what makes the church Christ's church, not just another man's religion. We do not want to be less than that. We must be soldiers who implicitly, implicitly trust in their commander's judgment. We yield to Christ when we yield to his word. 
and to the indwelling Holy Spirit, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Prayer becomes something more than an abstract devotional act. It's not just you meditating on some thoughts. Prayer calls upon the power of God to do what we, the created beings, the creatures, cannot do. The true church holds Christ in her midst in a definite and real way. We should appear to the world as people who have an advantage they don't, that have a direction, that have a sense of purpose that they can't even imagine, you see. Let us say forcibly that organization is not wrong. I, I know there are some groups that say, we don't believe in organization. We just gather together and maybe, maybe somebody says, well, I think I have something to say, and they stand up and do it. And this is not the way God in, in, in organized it. God gave an organization. God clearly commands that um, we have an organization and we see the need in a fallen world to have the organization, but just the organization that God gave. We're not going to be keep adding to it. Organization itself can become wrong if it, if that organization, is valued above the conscientious submission to Christ's plan for the church. Let's go with what Christ invented, what Christ set before us, what Christ gave to us, and um, stop adding our feeble thoughts to the thing. Look around at the complex religions the world has, uh, layer upon layer of priests and bishops and cardinals and who knows who else. So the whole popery thing is just bureaucracy, bureau bureaucratic churches. And God says, no, it's dealing with you personally. See. So let us fix our attention on Christ as the true head of the church. And so if the body starts doing things that the, that the head isn't saying, well, what, you know, you've got a problem there. It's, oh, stop that, you know. Uh, you, you want the body in control, being controlled by the head, by the brain. All right. Now, God commands the simplicity of organization. However, we do not fix on simplicity. You know, we'll just make it simpler and simpler. Just me sitting here by myself. Don't forget the reason for the simplicity. Let's fix attention on Christ. So we need organization and we need Christian leadership because God said, let's do it this way. Yet for us, the leaders are who? They're brothers and sisters of the people of God. What is the difference between you and me? Well, I'm standing here and you're sitting there, you see. That's really the only difference. I'm a human being. You're a human being. I'm a, 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 a creature of God. You're a creature of God. We have uh, been made in the image of God. We're the same. We're more the same than the, than the different. The real difference between us is that by your uh, giving to the pastor's salary, I have the time to spend in research and study and so on, I get the, the education to do the uh, uh, a little deeper study, and then I can put it into a form that more people can understand. And that's, that's just my job, see. That doesn't make me floating above the ground a holy person any more than you. We're just brothers and sisters. All right. They are not, we, the leadership, are not a separate category of relationship to Christ. God does not teach a separation of clergy and laity. Can I have that sink in? You know, the Baptists were persecuted by the organized church for not wearing robes. You say, why didn't they want to wear a robe? because it implied that they were something other than the people. <laughs> you know, I wear funny clothes, so I must be a priest. I must be some magical wizard wearing my pointy hat or something, or 
turned around collars. And, and you, you, think, you think wearing strange clothes makes you holier than somebody else? It certainly makes you different, but since that doesn't come from God, where, where in the Bible would you find that? See? Old Testament had priests, New Testament did not. Our high priest is Christ, and you and I are the priests before God. We are a priesthood. We don't need priests. We are priests. So members are to respect church officers, as God says, men created in the image of God. But officers are to respect members as the same. We're cut of the same cloth. Officers and members are equally sinners saved by grace. This is the only way that organization and leadership avoid standing in stark opposition to true spirituality. As soon as we start making this distinction, well, they are the clergy. You are the laity. You come to visit the real Christian at Christianity. See, as soon as we do this, we've lost true spirituality, which is what worship in the spirit, individual spirit. So, loyalty to the church. Once we have this clearly in mind, now we may speak of loyalty, and loyalty in the church follows a strict scale. Let's look at this. The first loyalty is to God as God. Uh, we know something of God. We have read, we have learned, we have uh, uh, been struck by the awe of God. This is your personal loyalty to the living God. So it is not your first loyalty to the church. It is not your first loyalty to the pastor, but to God above all other loyalties, even father, mother, family, you know, whatever, government. Loyalty to God first. Then second place, the second loyalty is to the Bible principles of his revealed word. Now, obviously, this, these principles principles that you're loyal to should not be different from God. But in the teaching of some churches, it is. Let's be clear. Not everybody is teaching the principles of God. So we are to examine that. Out of loyalty to God, we are to check his word. And why were the Bereans more noble than those of Thessalonica? Because they searched the Bible to see if what Paul was preaching was true. How dare you question? No, no. We are to question. Is this from the word of God? You hear something new from me or anyone, and you say, I haven't heard that before. I better check this out. You see? All right. Second loyalty. Uh, shouldn't be different. But in some churches it is. Fully. Believe the word of God because you are convinced that God is your God. And the principles are from him, and that's why they have authority. So we are trusting the word because God said he gave his word to teach us. The third loyalty, then, is to the church, the, the group, the body of the church, as God's vehicle for revealed truth. There's a moving attitude that uh, we, don't, we don't need to join churches. We don't need to be a part of that. We don't need that. Uh, I'll just be on my own. Well, God gave the church, you see. This is next because the church is not the invention of man. Man didn't just come up with this. It was presented to man. God created it and taught it in his scriptures. And then finally, the fourth loyalty is to the human leadership. See, So loyalty to the pastor, to the deacon of deacons, deacon board, is, uh, is a valuable thing in its place. So these must be kept in their proper order. If you start turning these around and you've got trouble, in fact, reversing the order is totally destructive when loyalty to human leadership becomes central, we are no better than a cult. 
You are, you are laying your life out for the whim of a human being. This is a pretty dangerous thing. No matter how attractive you might find the leadership for whatever reason. We become loyal to our own little party. Yet once human leadership has been voted in with all the safeguards of God's word, we are to give them the benefit of the doubt with our loyalty. That's what God says. We need to assume that God is leading us through them. That's why he says, obey those over you, for they watch for your soul. Now, once we keep our first loyalty to God as our first love, we will keep the subordinate loyalties in their proper balance. All right, the next point is that we are going to need to exercise discipline in the church and showing love. Now, there's, it's kind of like two ends of the same stick. But the church must have discipline because we're looking for the purity of the church, not, not the intermingling of the world and the church, the world and God, uh, as, as what we're dealing with in the, in the church. So remember that God's goal for discipline is the purity of the local church, but also remember that the goal of purity is not beating people up because they made a mistake, see? It's showing a loving relationship first to God. God bids me tell you that this is wrong, and then to the others. Do not lose track that we are for this goal and not against it. We're for the goal of restoration in discipline. Loving others is not antagonistic to church purity. See? Strength and love, uh, characteristic of Christ. We don't usually think of those things together. You know, steel girder, strong, loving thing is delicate and so on. But uh, when we need to discipline, we ought to exercise it for their sake and for God's sake. I should say it the other way around, for God's sake first, then for their sake. So in practice, we do not satisfy the rule of loving the church when we consider them as general, in general, as faceless beings. Yes, I love the church. It's, it's the individuals I can't stand. So, uh, now, that's not going to count. I'm not going to cut it. Remember, the humanist loves man but cares little about the individual. So. However, we do not and cannot intimately know every member of God's church on earth and certainly not his church across time. Hard to get to know those people all long gone. How then in practice can we love the church of Christ? Well, God showed us how. Here's the secret. Christians are to meet in local congregations. <laughs> oh, what an idea. We actually see your face. We take a hold of hands or at least bump elbows. In these gatherings, we can know Christ's body individually and show personal love and communication. Do not be deceived by our modern culture. People in their cell phones, little little islands roaming around, often bumping into each other and, and, and other things. God commands that we should assemble ourselves together until Jesus comes. Our verse, verses of the day of, of the week for uh, the bulletin, Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Let us consider one another, consider one another, think about one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Sometimes provoking may be irritating. I'm here to irritate you from moving, getting out of, of the, the, the rut you're in and provoke you to do something else. But provoke to what? Love and good works. To do better, to be better, to be the person that God always wanted you to be. 
but exhorting one another. This is that word that can mean encouraging them, comforting them, if they're in a place of sadness, or exhorting. They're just not where they ought to be, and you're urging them on. Come on, you can do it. And so much the more, as you see the day approaching, he doesn't explain what the day is, writing to these Hebrews, they were Hebrew Jewish Christians uh, living in Rome, and we're saying the pressure is on against Christians here, so we're going to stop being Christian, we're just going to be Jews again. We'll get, we'll get by without persecution. He says, no, just keep assembling. And as you see this day approaching, all the more, gather together, hold each other tight. Christianity is first a very personal and individual thing because it's in the heart, but it is not only an individual thing. There must be true community that offers true spiritual and material help to one another. Within the local church, God calls members to close to close personal contact. This fellowship is what stands under scrutiny, what the world sees. Many a church member, son or daughter, has been lost because though they grew up in a church, they saw nothing of real love in the church. Understand that modern man has lost his humanity. So the Bible-believing and the Bible-practicing local church gives modern man something to see, and we reveal that true human relationship is possible. The church is neither a group of strangers sitting under one roof or a group of simpletons stuck in their provincial thinking. We ain't simpletons. Let me hear a yee-haw. Oh, no, no, no. I mean... We're, we're not just people that read this pamphlet one day and say, yeah, let's get together and do that. See? Rational people. We are a group of regular people from various occupations, having diverse educational backgrounds, differing abilities of talent and intellect, yet we relate to one another in a love relationship, a family relationship. We must not choose to think of our church as an upper, middle class, west side, indie, old friends from high school group of Americana. Right, Meseret? <laughs> Just here because you we're here with the people you've met in high school. Evidently not. First Corinthians twelve twenty seven. Here's a, an important thing that you'll miss in the English. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. This tells us a great deal about the local church compared to the entire body of Christ. The body of Christ, in the Greek, it does not have the definite article. So he's not talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about that which has the character of body of Christ. The local church of Corinth was of the body of Christ, was body of Christ. Members in particular translates mele ek merus. Mele is member, as an arm or a leg is a member of your body. And ek marus, ek is ek, out. Ek marus literally means out of, part of the whole thing. It's like taking a piece of your pizza out. This is a piece of pizza on its own, but it is part of the whole thing. And that says that Open Door Baptist Church is a piece of the whole thing. So each local church has the characteristics of being body of Christ and exists before the world as part of the whole body. In other words, open door is one aspect of Christ's body. So then what is his body? What's the whole thing? Well, his body is from all countries, from all levels of society, from all degrees of education, and from all time. It is that which will be gathered at the rapture. You see, that's the full body of Christ. So we gather as fellow believers first, because we're fellow Christians. Then we find that there's more of us that maybe aren't quite believing the same, so we gather together as Bible believers second. Then we get together as um, church members third. So we actually join this, this church. So open door is open to the intellectual, 
to the working man, who's not necessarily not an intellectual, I understand that, but and to the triumphant saint and to the struggling sinner. It's open. One fellow visited and said, a lot of churches don't want me to come. I said, we're open door. We're open. We want you to come. I'm not going to ask you to take leadership here. <laughs> but I ask you to come and learn. In fact, we are open to all who seek to grow in Christ. For we know the essential purpose of the church in bringing Christians is bringing Christians to maturity. We get this from Ephesians 4.12. For the perfecting of the saints. Christ gave pastors and teachers in the context to the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we refuse to be stuck in an unchanging ritual because the world is changing. This is the focus of this lesson that we need to be reaching out. We need to be connecting to people as we live in this modern world. Our goal is to reach the world within the structure, uh, the structure of Scripture and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, there's an adventure to follow, new people to embrace as friends and various spiritual and material needs to meet. So this is the goal. We, we grow as who we are, and we take that to the world. You put over your, your door to the outside. You are now entering the mission field. And be ready to share. All right. Went over. So you probably have things to say, but we don't have time. All right. Let's stand together then and be dismissed with prayer. Father, you've given us an opportunity to consider that while the church is giving us the opportunity of growth and understanding, your goal for us as individuals is to win the world to thee, to witness to the world of thee. And we do that primarily by the way we approach life, the way we approach other people, the way we treat one another. And as they see there's something different about us, that there's a, a happiness that goes beyond what happens to a joy that doesn't matter what's happened. Then they ask, what makes you different? We ask, Father, you might help us to prepare an answer that ask of the hope that lies within us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.